It's a great privilege and a great privilege, Hugh, to be invited up. I think one of the very most terrific things about Hugh is his willingness to debate. You know, I think Hugh's really exactly as Brendan said, he has authored, I would go further than, you know, one in a decade paper, the most influential inter international relations strategic field um, anything in Australia, going right, right back to that early period, the 60s, I would say. Uh, it's had a huge influence around the world and the degree of public support amongst public intellectuals um, in particular who uh, receives across Australia is matched only by the private animosity he generates in the corridors <laughs> <laughs> of Canberra and elsewhere, including Washington. And you know, that's one of the fascinating things. There's two levels of debate about China. One takes place in the corridors, the secret corridors. One takes place out there. And I think, you know, what I've tried to sort of try and draw some of these conversations together in, in my work. And this will be an opportunity to, to do that a little bit better than I have to date. Now, one of the reviews that you didn't read out then was the actual, actually the first one. I think it's um, one of the most um, startling reviews I've ever read of an academic piece of work. I'm going to read it and you can tell me if you can um, guess the author. Professor Hugh White, and this is September 11, 2010. Professor Hugh White of the Australian National University has done something remarkable. He has written the single stupidest strategic <laughs> document ever prepared in Australian history by someone who once held a position of some responsibility in our system. White's well, astonishing document, and, and on it goes. And, and you, know, you know who I'm talking about. I don't think Greg, get stuck in. Greg hasn't missed a beat. You know, he's kept on in that sort of mode for, uh, in the intervening five years. But So one thing you cannot accuse Hugh of not doing is starting a conversation. Uh, he wrote this essay at a time when, uh, and he's absolutely right, he identified the big question that nobody... Sorry, that's just me. Um, that nobody was directly addressing how would China uh, change the regional order as it grows and its ambitions grow? What would this more crowded strategic space look like? Now, um, I sometimes think that Hugh probably doesn't give enough credit to some thinking that you know, has been going on in the corridors for some time, but it was never brought to the surface except you know, for a micro moment in Kevin Rudd's white paper of 2009, and then perhaps another micro moment um, when China announced its ADIZ um, in the East China Sea shortly after the arrival of the Abbott government. Um, in between, we had an astonishing development where I think the public silence grew, particularly under Gillard, and below the, water, below the surface level, um, you know, Australia was moving into full hedge mode. It was all about we're worried about China, how do we deal with it? Um, how do we hedge our bets? How do we respond security, security rise? But on the surface, it was the same old um, you know, opp opportunity and Panglossian sort of po you know, Pollyanna as far as the eye could see. Um, I would say, Hugh, that that conversation has finally started to come together. And uh, particularly in the last few weeks, I excuse my rusty joints. Um, and there's been some really important debates and I'm, uh, well, people ex uh, entering the debate publicly in the last two months and from different points of view, but I really do applaud them for engaging with Hugh in public, even if they don't name him by name, but they all are talking about him. Michael Thorley here at the Australian National University back in July. Uh, Dennis Richardson, Secretary of Defence, a little bit earlier about South China Sea. Kevin Andrews, you know, to my wild surprise, had a very eloquent and interesting um, uh, speech at Shangri-La in Singapore. And most recently, and I think most uh, impressively, with Peter Varghese last week um, in his speech to the Lowy Institute. All of them, in their very different ways, from their very different angles and different strengths, are starting to address publicly the very big uh, dilemmas that Hugh raises in his, uh, in his essay and develops in his subsequent book and his essays in, in my papers, the Fairfax Press in particular, um, in the intervening five years. I you know, have got some questions for, for Hugh. I also encourage you to, to think of what you want to hurl at either of us um, throughout the night. I'm not going to sit here and occupy the floor the whole time. But perhaps I can begin, Hugh, by asking you to answer Brendan's question. What did you get wrong? <laughs> well, first of all, thank you all very much for coming.
Uh, thank you, Brendan and, and Andrew, for organising this, and particularly thank you, uh, John, for taking part in this conversation. Um, uh, I, I can't resist the temptation to return your very kind compliment by saying that the quality of John's journalism on China in particular has been one of the bright spots, the very bright spots, in what is in so, sometimes a rather gloomy picture about Australian public debate about these issues. So look, let me... The heart of the quarterly essay was a series of six propositions. The first was that China's power really was growing and that it constituted the biggest, most fundamental shift in the distribution of wealth and power in many decades, arguably in centuries, perhaps actually in human history, and certainly the biggest shift in the distribution of wealth and power since Australia was settled by Europeans. The second proposition was that as China's power grew, its view of its own role in the international system was going to change, or if one should say revert. That China, as its power grew, was going to seek uh, a different role in Asia. It was not going to accept US primacy. It was going to seek a new model of great power relations and the phrase that Xi Jinping had not then used, but now uses all the time, um, which would be a radical challenge to the order in Asia which prevailed particularly since the end of the Vietnam War, because that order had been characterised not just by US primacy, but by a US primacy which is uncontested by any major power. The third proposition was that the United States would, as it if it continued on the trends that it had clearly established, would resist China's attempt to change the regional order would seek, as with all the elements of American power, as the phrase Barack Obama has used since I published the essay, to preserve US primacy as a foundation for the Asian order. And the fourth point was that the clash between China's growing power and ambition and America's determination to preserve the status quo would lead to escalating strategic rivalry between the US and China. And that that would have huge significance for Australia because our whole vision of our national future was that we would continue to grow rich on China's wealth and stay safe thanks to American power. And that model's worked very well for us for the last few decades. All of us, certainly I, would love it to last forever. But that the further strategic rivalry between the US and China escalated, the more, the starker the choices that countries like Australia and Australia in particular would face as it found itself increasingly compelled to make choices between those. And the risk that we would be forced to make a really ult an ultimate choice, not just a small tactical choice, but a really grand strategic choice, would grow as the risk of an absolutely fundamental rupture between the US and China, a conflict arose. Not that I've ever regarded a conflict as inevitable, or even very, very likely, but it's a clear risk and the risk clearly grows as rivalry escalates. And the sixth point was that Australia therefore faced a huge set of policy challenges. Two, really. The first was what we could do with others, of course, to try and avert the trajectory of escalating rivalry, which I saw being set in train. And the second was, what could we do to prepare ourselves for the possibility that we would fail to avert it and therefore find ourselves faced with a catastrophic choice and living in a region which would be very different from the one we've known and loved, very different from the one upon which we base our entire international posture, one in which the US and China might be in, in conflict with one another, or bitter, bitter strategic rivals, one in which the United States might in fact have withdrawn from Asia in order to avoid that. And that these set of policy challenges seem to me to be ones which Australian governments across the political spectrum had failed to effectively address. Now, I owe you an answer to your question. What <laughs> because allow me to say, not much. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, naturally, I may well, one's, examine one's conscience. Have I, have I retrospectively adjusted the arguments I made in the essay to suit what's actually happened? Will you be the judge? I don't think so. Um, it's, not, it's not that it was a terribly difficult argument to mount. Always looked to me pretty obvious. But I did get some things 
not as right as I might have. I underestimated how fast China's economy would grow. Um, even over that time frame, I think, I actually reread it for a while, but I think I put the date at which China's economy overtakes America's and become the biggest in the world at 2030. Well, if you believe the latest PwC estimates of PPP, um, measure of GDP, my students are very sick of these statistics, but by 2030, um, China's economy uh, in PPP terms is already 30% um, uh, bigger than America's. So it's not just that China's economy overtakes America's, it keeps on growing significantly faster than America, probably, but very probably, and therefore requires a quite decisive margin of economic weight. The second thing I think I underestimated was how fast China's growing maritime capabilities would limit US military options and how quickly America would respond and recognise that. Um, uh, and uh, the third thing I underestimated was how slow the United States would be to nonetheless recognise the significance of China's challenge. I guess the biggest surprise I've had is how hard it's been to convince Americans that China is really serious about challenging US primacy and therefore to start the debate about how the United States should respond to it. So I think Hugh is more or less saying that his biggest mistake is he didn't go far enough. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so let me play devil's advocate for a little moment. So um, I think there are a couple of really important implicit assumptions in power shift five years ago and I don't think they have panned out exactly as assumed. Um, and <coughs> essentially, I think it is related to um, whether or not concepts like the Chinese have been examined close <coughs> enough, closely enough. You know, what is the Chinese? What do you mean? Um, there's a lot of them, and <laughs> you know, and in different, you know, um, well, with very different interests often. Um, and you also, I think, perhaps strip away a little bit too much of the peculiarities of the Chinese Communist Party and how it exercises power. Um, at one stage you say that it's still Leninist, but it's, it's thrown away all the old idea, all, all the old communist yeah. ideology. I'd like to know exactly what that is, because yeah. I reckon the more things change, the more things sometimes stay the same. On, that's one question. And flowing from that, I think, is, is, is some basic philosophies of how uh, China, Beijing exercises power. Uh, you know, at the core of this essay is a, a, an assumption that, that, that the problem in coming to a grand bargain, a concert of power, would be on the American side. Um, I think it's more complicated than that. You know, I would actually go as far as to question when is it in Chinese Communist Party history where they've shown a willingness to do, to make an enduring um, pact, concert of powers, grand bargain, really on, on any level, you know, rather than a, a, an agreement to reflect the relative bargaining power powers of particular parties at a particular point in time, as almost any bruised foreign business person in China will attest. And so why do we think that the way that the Chinese Communist Party exercises power in China, where it is explicitly above any law, it's explicitly above really any values because it hasn't ever really defined consistently over time what it stands for, apart from um, its own hold on power and loyalty to the system. Um, why would it impose a, a, you know, a greater respect or a different or respect a different set of norms and values, uh, including the idea of striking an enduring bargain when it left its shores? Query number one. Two, I think the, the, the weakness in this argument, and I think it's gone become greater over time, is what about you know, all the two billion or so people in between? So what about how Vietnam sees the world? What about how Japanese people see the world? Um, what about India with its, uh, you know, sooner than we thought, going to overtake China with its um, one billion plus? population uh, and to a lesser extent other countries in the region. And I think there's a, you know, there's a, there is a bit of an assumption in this book 
in this in this essay that these guys would naturally gravitate to where their bread bled, their bread is buttered. You know, they would gravitate to China as if it's almost an otherwise neutral choice. Well, one power, country A, country B, um, the blue team and the red time, the red, the red team. Let's go with the red team now because um, they're paying the bills. It hasn't panned out that way. I would say that if you look around the region of the maritime powers, which we're really talking about, or just states, uh, in every single case, except for, you, know, you could probably argue over South Korea at the moment, in every other case, the uh, strategic game's gone the other way. And so for all um, of America's strategic arrogance, of which there is plenty, um, of all the fact that nobody ever likes you know, America as an idea unless they kind of need them. Um, and f for, and the, you know, I think it's been astonishing how quickly all these states have, have flocked to the American uh, security embrace. And whereas it's depicted in this essay, and I think in some of his further writings, as a case of America pushing, prodding, provoking, uh, forcing states to come into its um, orbit, you know, often it's been the other way around. And for example, just three weeks ago, Admiral Scott Swift, who's the new Pacific Com uh, Fleet Commander, who prides himself on controlling the waters between Madagascar and San Diego, um, I, I asked him, you know, do you want to have greater facilities in Fremantle and Darwin? And he said, look, to be honest, we really can't be bothered. It's kind of really costly to set up these things. And when you've got every port in the region begging to have our ships and to look after them for free, why would we go and pay a billion dollars to, to deepen ports in Fremantle when they're so far away from the action? So there is a huge new demand for an American strategic um, presence in the region. And that follows, I think, from another um, questionable assumption at the start here, and that is, here we talk about, she talks about um, that uh, there's a spot here where we talk about Beijing would find that the more harshly it tried to dominate Asia, the more opposition it would face from these powers. It is therefore much more likely that China will see its interests better served by aiming lower. Um, and you talk about being unlikely that China would try to impose its will by, by force or political repression. Now, we can argue about degrees, but I, I don't think that's the case. I think the reason that so many of these states I'm talking about in the middle are flocking t uh, towards each other and towards American security embrace is because they've seen that China's not, no longer just wooing them, but it's been, you know, there's been a threat explicitly or implicitly of coercive force. So that's essentially my critique of of the essay five years ago, and uh, you know, I think empirically, the model, you know, the model works in the abstract. Empirically, I think the strategic picture has become much more crowded, congested, and complicated um, as time goes on. Great. Well, no, really, really, very, very good, a, a very, a very good set of points. So let me send the ball back across the net Please. to you on each of those three points. Um, the first one's actually complicated point. It, it, the first point raised is that who are the Chinese and what do they want? Well, the first point to know is I know that much, much, much less well than this guy does, who really knows China very well and I don't know China really at all. But my argument, the, 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 the basis of my argument about, uh, which as you rightly say, is right at the heart of my logic, that as China's power grows, it will seek a bigger role in Asia. Is, um, is not based on anything that's distinctively Chinese or even anything that's distinctively communist. It's that I'm just working on the hypothesis that the Chinese are normal. What they want to do with their power, what every other country has done with its power as its power has grown. That China is, it seeks, seeks what Britain sought as its power grew, what Japan saw as its power grew, what America saw as its power grew, what Russia saw as its power grew, etc. Or for that matter, Athens and Sparta and the Romans and so on. Now it's a very interesting question, almost a philosophical question, why do states and their peoples yearn for power like that? But it does appear to be a very consistent feature of the international system that countries see their place in the system, see their place in the order, as terribly important to their prosperity, their security, and their identity and their sense of themselves. 
and that they will strive, if, the, if they feel they have the capacity, they will strive for leadership within it. So my, my, work, my working hypothesis might prove to be wrong, but my working hypothesis is that China will do what everybody else has done. Um, but it is worth adding a kind of an element to that, because I just said the argument isn't, basic, isn't based on anything specific to the Chinese, but it does seem to me that there are some things about China which make me even more confident of that judgment than I would otherwise be generically. And that is that it seems to me that Chinese of our time, think of a Chinese of my generation. Uh, so I was born in 1953. If I was Chinese, I would remember the Great Famine. Just to, you know, I probably might remember losing family members in the Great Famine. I would have a very vivid memory of the Cultural Revolution. I would either have been out there feeding pigs somewhere in the boonies, or I'd have been running around the cities putting dunces caps on people, or maybe worse. My education would have been disrupted, but I would have joined the workforce, as I did here in Canberra, in China somewhere in 1980. And within my professional lifetime, I would have seen the whole deal unfold in front of me. So what is a Chinese like that? How do they see their present situation? They see it, it seems to me, through the lens of a very strong sense of China's remarkable history. We all know that. A very strong sense, perhaps exaggerated, but not entirely, of grievance at what was done to China, as they would say, and partly done by people like us, in the 200 years since the Opium Wars. A very strong sense of what China has achieved in their professional lifetimes. They must be immensely proud. How proud would you be of what they've achieved? And a cautious but very deep confidence in where they're going. That seems to me to be a very potent brew of attitudes, which turbocharges, I suspect, turbocharges what you might call the normal generalised point I make about. So I don't know what Chinese think. But I, but I put it this way, it would be a very heroic assumption to assume the opposite. To assume that China, as its power grew to overtake the United States and become the biggest economy in the world, would be prepared to accept American primacy as a foundation for the Asian order, the way Japan did. Japan is, in fact, I think the only historical example of a country not seeking a role in the international system commensurate with its, with its economic weight. And Japan did that under very specific circumstances. I, th I think it'd be a very dangerous assumption to assume it, it works that way. As for the CCP, of course, very you know, to say that, I mean, you know a lot more about China than I do. You certainly know a lot more about the Communist Party than I do. And I found your writings on that were really extremely fascinating. But I would, my point about the CCP um, is, well, partly that it seems to me that what the CCP is really committed to is preserving its own position. And that's why I call it essentially a Leninist institution more than anything else. So I think anything is available for compromise on that, on that basis. Um, so I take your point whether, whether or not that means that all elements of, all, all of the other elements of communist ideology have been thrown aside yet or are just susceptible of being thrown aside as the sleigh continues down the path is well, an interesting question. Maybe the other elements were never that important. Well, that, that, might, yeah. that, that, that might be it. That might be it. But I, but I would just make this point. It doesn't seem to me that there's any, that, that, that this is going to sound a little bit strange, almost flippant, but I think I mean it quite seriously. I don't think the future of the Communist Party is terribly important to the future of China as a strategic actor in the Asian strategic order. I think a China which was no longer ruled by the Communist Party and was ruled by somebody else would still be likely to behave in largely the same way. It's not that I think the Communists are going to, I mean, maybe the Communist Party will survive, maybe it'll go, but I think the idea that we have a, that China is challenging the strategic order in Asia because of a feature of communist ideology rather than what you might very broadly call nationalist sentiment is a misunderstanding of what drives these, these things. The third point, the really important one, is would, have we got any reason to believe that China would actually accept the, um, a, a deal that was done with the United States? Part of my argument is that the way out of the dilemma that I've described is that the US and China should reach an agreement to share power in Asia. And quite a lot of, a bit of the essay and quite a lot of the book I've subsequently published tries to flesh out how, how on earth that would work. And it's a really critical question. Could you trust China to stick by that kind of deal? And the answer is no. Of course you could. China would only stick by that deal if it was very clear that by but violating that deal would meet a devastating sanction. That the shape 
of an, any international order is in the end defined by the circumstances in which the members of that order are prepared to go to war to preserve it. And so if you want to put some boundaries around China's power, you, you, you're going to have to impose those boundaries on the basis of your clear willingness, clear to them, that you're willing to go to war against them with all of the costs and risks that, that entails to prevent it. Uh, to, pr to, pr to prevent them kicking over it. So there's no, 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 part, no part of my model of a, of a concept of Asia, which is what I proposed, that it should be preserved by sort of kumbaya, you know, let's all hold hands and be nice to one another. Just like the concept of Europe, which was held together by the sure knowledge that if any country tried to establish primacy of over the whole of Europe during the 19th century, it would face the other four powers united against it. That's what made the concept tick. And if you, want to, if you want to see any such agreement in Asia, it's not just that the four powers, as I think they are, would have to agree on the, the basis of that, but they'd also have to agree on the enforcement of it with that foundation. So I completely agree that none of this should be based on the idea of, a, of trust. It's not trust, it's tougher than that. But as you say, there are a lot of other powers. And uh, the question as to how other countries in Asia see China's power is a really critical one. Um, I think, though, that this is. Um, I, think, I, I think this is simpler than it sometimes seems. Every power in Asia wants to avoid living under China's shadow, and everybody in Asia knows that strong U.S. role in Asia is the best way of avoiding living under China's shadow. So everybody wants the United States to continue to play a strong role in Asia. On the other hand, everybody in Asia values their relationship with China enormously. So, and everyone fears the consequences for them of a bad US-China relationship. And nobody wants to be forced to make a choice between the US and China. So everybody wants the United States to stay engaged in Asia. But everybody wants the United States to stay engaged in Asia on a basis which does not drive escalating rivalry between the US and China. And so while they want the United States to play a strong role in Asia, I think they're much less fussed about whether the United States' role is primacy, whether the United States continues to dominate. We all want the United States to stay in Asia to balance China. We're much less sure we want the United States to stay in Asia to dominate China if that's going to drive escalating strategic rivalry between the US and China. 95% of what we want can be satisfied by a strong US balancing presence. The problem is that's not what America wants. America's strategic objective in Asia today is to preserve US primacy. Why do you say that? Because that's what they say. Look at the word leadership. You, you watch, watch the way the word leadership is used. For example, in President Obama's speech in Brisbane during the uh, uh, G20, the most starkly anti-Chinese speech given by any American president since Nixon went to China in 1972. Oh. I, I, I can't recall the count, but the number of times the word American or leadership is used is striking. And, and I think that's, it's, it's that disconnect between America's objectives and the objective of everybody else in Asia. And so I say, I'm agreeing with you, they, that, that they do want America to stay engaged, but they don't want America to stay engaged to do exactly what America wants to do. And the test for this becomes how much substance is there to the alignment that we see between the US and other regional countries. And you're absolutely right. The other regional countries have been happy to reach out to the United States and say, come and help us. But what does that really mean? Um, uh, which of those countries are really willing to sacrifice their relationship with China in order to support the United States in Asia? Let's take an example at random. Let's take Australia. The, the pattern of Australian policy since the pivot was announced, for example, is that we talk big and do very little. Uh, the, 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 the neatest recent demonstration of this was the moment at which the poor US official was unwise enough to suggest that B-1 bombers were going to be transiting through Darwin. And Tony Abbott, even by his standards, was remarkably agile to get in front of a microphone repeatedly and say, that's not going to happen. Australia's alliance with America is not directed against anyone. He explicitly repudiated the explicit statement by the US official that, that the US forced deployments to Darwin were part of a US posture against, aimed at China's position in the South China Sea. That is because in the end, Australia is not actually prepared 
to see itself being signed up in an anti-China coalition with the United States. It doesn't actually appear to go that way. That's why Barack Obama makes a big speech in, in Brisbane on the Saturday and Tony Abbott stands up and welcomes <coughs> Xi Jinping to our parliament on the Monday, if I remember the sequence correctly. Yeah, so these were empirical questions about what America means by leadership that the region yeah, doesn't yeah, want. Yeah. And I would argue that actually the, that America's not to not hasn't shown itself willing to push really hard on what most of the region doesn't want yeah. most of the time. Yeah. Um, and on that question of that particular weekend, and I do remember, how could I forget the headline, and, um, um, Abbott clueless on US and China, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Swinging hopelessly between the two poles of China and the US. Yeah. You know, I actually don't see it that way at all. I think that the alignment between the Abbott government and Washington on the underlying strategic play in this region, not anywhere else, um, is, is almost perfect. Um, and they, dis they, they do things differently. Australia's small. We, we actually talk pretty small most of the time. Um, and so we want to say we love you, Xi Jinping, when you come to Australia, can you sign my trade agreement? Um, but underlying, you know, I think actually that if anything, Australia's been <coughs> impatient to have more US military balancing in the region than less. So I disagree just on the, yeah, on the yeah, empirical yeah, analysis. Yeah. No, it, you, you're right, and it is an empirical question, and it's an empirical question on which inevitably our data is a little imperfect. Um, but I, I think I would, and, and, it's, and it's a perfectly you know, legitimate question which one just has to stand back and say, hmm, interesting to see, but I would just nudge back a half a step by saying I, I, I see plenty of evidence that um, the Abbott government, and for that matter the Gillard government before them, is doing less for the US in Asia than the US would like. That there is suspicion in Washington that Australia talks a good line, but is not in the end willing to stand by the United States in resisting China's challenge to US primacy. And when, for example, you see an Australian Defence Minister say in words of one syllable that in the event of a US-China conflict over Taiwan, Australia is not part of it. Um, then, if you're an American, you think, really, what's this alliance been all about all these decades? Um, uh, no one has had the experience of being uh, subjected to Rich Armitage in full flight <laughs> lightly forgets it, and I do treasure the recollection of sharing a platform like this with Rich Armitage in which Rich leaned across and kind of grabbed hold of me, and he is about <laughs> three and a half people stuck into one suit, and, and said, you I'd have thought that if a small democracy offshore Asia is subject to Chinese aggression, any other small democracies offshore Asia ought to be there to help them. And I think that is, remains a strong view. So I think it's, you're, you're right, it's a, it's a question on which the data is mixed, but I, I think that the evidence is at least partially my way. Sure. Let me know who I should interview that. I'll be uh -huh. Oh, yes, OK. Um, look, one question, and, and then I'm going to yep. open it up to yep. the floor, if that's yep. OK. And oh, actually, let me make a, a small, moderate sermon. And that's the, <laughs> the question of whether you know, China's preparedness to go to war, which isn't yeah. really addressed in yeah. here because yeah. this is about yeah. cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I yeah. think you present, you know, if the Taiwanese people of their own volition decide they want to join the mainland on such a basis, why should the US object? Yeah. You know, I think that's a bit of a, the Gough Whitlam East Timor kind of um, formula because in Taiwan, that's not the way it's going. You know, Taiwan is not volunteering to to sign up to the mainland political program. We can. Yeah, I, I think yeah, it's increasingly yeah, going that way. Yeah. But the question, therefore, is China's preparedness, I think in your terms, yeah. to go to war to get yeah. what it wants. Yeah. I, I think, see something quite different. I see the, you know, the greatest kind of spending on fancy, shiny um, hardware, mm. military hardware that the world, this region's seen, um, well, ever, really. Um, and you know, the capacity to inflict you know, terrible damage, no question. But, and again, this comes back to the political structures. Since the Korean War, the Chinese military has never really fought a real war. Um, and in fact, I don't think that there's anybody in China that really thinks, you know, in a serious position, who really thinks that the military is there for an externally defensive um, purpose. They just 
don't believe that anybody's going to invade China. And, you know, that might have been a fear before they had nuclear weapons, but it's, it's not today, and I've heard senior generals say that. Uh, and so the question is, are they really developing a military to project serious force in a way that could um, push back the, Amer um, the United States in a sustained complex theatre? And look, I actually don't think so for one fundamental reason. The way this system operates, when it's allowed to, you know, different if it's a moment of civil war, mm -hmm. and it was different in the Korean War, but in the 60, 70 years since, it's operated in incredibly siloed lines because that's the way the Leninist system is designed. There's very little horizontal trust in the system, and close to the top, there's actually very little trust between commanders and deputies. And if you think about just the examples of the last 18 months, we've seen the new Generalismo arrest the top two previous generals, um, um, Xu Tsai Ho and Guo Bo Xiong. And so that's the amount of trust that there is in this system. You know, you die, I live, is the Chinese, you know, <laughs> um, literally, Nisa Wo Ho. They're not talking about international relations, they're talking about the cockpit. And in that system where there is not very much trust at all, except for that which is built up over huge amounts of time, and these are family alliances, these are factional alliances, sometimes inherited two generations um, down the line, you know, in, unless you have that kind of established camaraderie, it doesn't exist across, across silos and across factional mm -hmm. lines. So which Chinese commander is going to trust a submarine, what are they called, drivers? <laughs> drivers, yes. You know, with, with, a li with a live nuclear weapon, which is, you know, pretty much, I, I don't know much about this stuff, I really don't, but, you know, the definition of a second strike capability. Um, you know, I don't think it's really likely to happen. Um, which Chinese president, commander, Central Military Commission chairman is going to actually trust his a chief of staff to, to organise um, coordinated military commands in, in, which can unify the 1,400 ballistic missiles aimed at Taiwan, the separate military commands, regional commands on the east coast there, plus the East China Sea Navy, plus the Air Force. Um, you know, we haven't actually seen that happen, which is, I think, a prerequisite for a sustained invasion of even what's defined as the fundamental military target, Taiwan. So I, I question, I, I think the military is hugely about theatre. It's about convincing, you know, and it does go back to this Sun Tzu stuff, which they still kind of parrot um, as if it's relevant today, and it might be. Um, it's about the theatre of convincing others that you're serious and you let your kind of crazy hawks say these crazy things, um, but you don't really mean it. I hope, you hope that they back down. You hope to win the war without firing a shot. I think there's nothing that Xi Jinping would not do to um, avoid a war, a full war with the United States. Yeah, it's a really important point. Um, and the uh, first point is to absolutely agree or rather, you know, acknowledge the very significant points you're making about how unknown is China's military capability and military culture even. And I don't for a moment disagree with the points you make about how complex those questions and how, and how uncertain they are. It, I just make the point, this is actually quite common in strategic affairs. Very common not to have a very clear sense of how good your adversary is. Um, you know, it's a slightly theatrical example, but think of of uh, Hitler facing the Russians or the Japanese facing the Americans, not realising just how formidable these countries are. Now, you're absolutely right that the Chinese have got no experience of fighting serious wars for a very long time. It is worth bearing in mind that the sort of war we'd be talking about between the US and China, the, Ameri the Americans have got no experience of it either. It's 70 years this month since there was a major power maritime war. No, nobody knows what maritime war would look like. Nobody's fought it. There's a whole new generation, several new generations of weapons have emerged. And nobody really knows what works and what doesn't. Now, of course, I have very high regard for the US military and so on, but I don't think they're infallible. And I have, I think, a healthy level of scepticism about new and emerging militaries, but you can, it's just a sort of prudential judgment I think one would be unwise to presume that the Chinese can't make 50% of what they've got going work, and 50% would be enough. 
and that brings us kind of an operational point here which is really critical, that China is in a very real sense un uninvadable. Sure. And the Chinese are absolutely right to think that. And it's certainly uninvadable by the United States. Um, the United States is not a continental power, um, and certainly not on the scale required. I mean, they proved that in Iraq. Um, so I think that, that that is absolutely right. But what China needs to do militarily in order to achieve its strategic objective is to undermine, that is, strategic objective of undermining US leadership and promoting its own, is to undermine the military foundation of US strategic leadership in Asia. And the military foundation of US strategic leadership in Asia has been forever its capacity to project power by sea. Now, the, 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 the Chinese have not and will not any time that need bother us acquire the capacity to project power by sea themselves against a, a country as powerful as the United States. The United States is very easily capable of fighting and sinking Chinese ships. Therefore, the Chinese aircraft carrier is just a career opportunity for an ambitious young uh, US submarine commander, or Japanese, <laughs> or whatever. But the converse is also true. China has acquired over the last 20 years the capacity to raise the costs and risk to the United States of projecting power by sea against China, to the point where that option has now more or less, I think, as a practical point of policy, disappeared. There is a solution to that, of course. America can regain the sea control required to sail the carriers and the marines up close to China's coast, and that is by running a, a, a strike campaign against a target set of, you know, pick a number, maybe 500 separate targets in China, stretch of a campaign stretching over, say, two months, that would make the first week of operate, first month of Operation Desert Storm look like a picnic. In other words, a full-scale war with China, massively escalatory, which means it's not really a strategic option for the United States at all. And even if the Chinese system turns out to be really bung and a whole lot of stuff doesn't work, the chances of sinking a carrier are still pretty good. Sure. And that's, and of course the real question is, what effect does that have on American decision making? Now, I, I completely agree China absolutely does not want a war with the United States. And they only are interested in doing all of this stuff because they can, in the best sense of tradition, believe they can win the war without fighting. So does America. China believes it can achieve its objectives of displacing the United States from the leadership of Asia without fighting because it thinks the Americans are going to back off. And America thinks it can achieve its objectives of sustaining its leadership in Asia just in, in the front of face of Chinese challenge, because they think China's going to back off. Now, that's OK as long as one or other of them is right. The risky thing, well, maybe they're both right, but the really risky thing is they both turn out to be wrong. And this is the point at which our present situation is a little bit like 1914, July 1914. What went wrong in July 1914 is that the Austrians thought the Russians were back down, the Russians thought the Austrians were back down, the Germans thought the Russians were back down, the Russians thought the Germans were back down. Everybody thought everyone else would back down, so they didn't have to. So if you're Xi Jinping, you think America's going to back off, so you can have a huge win without suffering humiliation. And the Americans, I fear, think that the Chinese will back off, so they can suffer, they can have a huge win. And the risk is that they're both wrong, and they both find themselves facing exactly the choice that people faced in the last week of July 1914, which is that they either do go ahead into a conflict or they have to suffer a really heroic humiliation. So if the United States does decide to do a freedom of navigation transit over Fari Cross Reef and the Chinese do put a missile through a P-8 and the United States do then send in a destroyer and the destroyer is sunk. I'm going to New Zealand. Yeah, well, this, but this is the point. I mean, this is, of course, it was very important to, to, to balance, to, to strike the balance between something which like one predicts, I don't predict this, but, but acknowledging it as a possibility. This is a possibility we have to deal with, and it's a possibility that Barack Obama has to deal with, and so does Xi Jinping. And so I think it is, although I agree the military is probably much less, there's much less to the PLA than meets the eye, there's still enough sure. to make this a very dangerous situation. Sure. Thank you, Hugh. He's certainly clarified you know, what we need to think about in very important ways, what we care about, what we're prepared to fight about. Um, I would love to get some questions. Maybe for t um, We've got time for a few, I think. Have we got a microphone? We do. Um, who would like to, to start off questions? Just got one here. 
this is for Professor White. Uh, you mentioned about uh, just now. You were saying that the Americans, if they decided to bomb the China, the 500 cities across in the Convention of War, the question is: once the Convention of War starts, it will be rapid escalation into a full nuclear exchange. Now, if they allow 50 nuclear warheads able to reach the United States, we're looking at around 50 to 100 million Americans. Now, if you are men in Washington in, in the White House, would you want to do that? And when it's all over, and you still have Russia, the mighty Russia, yeah. they yeah. enough in the instant of yeah. betrayal yeah. the United yeah. States. It's a so those time of crazy thinking, I personally think that America would not go to war with China unless China challenged it. For example, they decided to initiate the first war over Hawaii or continental United States. Yeah. But I can guarantee you that China is no, not, they is not interested whatsoever to challenge America. All they want is what they preserve, what they have, <laughs> and what they think is theirs. For yeah. example, East China Sea, the Diaoyang. In 1972, when the Japan and China yeah. agreed yeah. Yeah. Well, that well, those well, islands what's the yeah. question? be for well, the next generation. Yeah. Let me just so ask. my question is, yeah. Yeah. how likely America yeah. is going to go to war yeah. Yeah. over the South China Sea? No, no. I take, look, I think that you, the point you raised is a very important one, and that is the <coughs> underlying... Well, the question is, how do we factor, and how do US and Chinese decision makers factor the risk of escalation across the nuclear threshold into their calculations in these sorts of situations? And it's a very difficult question to answer because we, the, 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 nuclear weapons are still only 70 years old. They've only been used twice. And the, most of the data we have about the way in which nuclear weapons affect the relationships, all the data we have about the way in which nuclear weapons affect the relationships with that great powers, comes from one particular example, one case study. That is, the relationship between the superpowers during the Cold War. And that taught us lots. But it was a very different kind of confrontation between very different kinds of powers and very different strategic, including geographical circumstances. So the real answer to the question is nobody on either side really knows what role nuclear weapons play. Nobody knows where the threshold is. Um, and therefore, one hopes both sides are very careful about how they conduct themselves. Um, however, I do think there is a risk of misunderstanding on both sides. There continues to be a view, I think, in the United States. I have no idea whether, to, so to speak, the serious um, nuclear strategists, the professional nuclear strategists in the heart of the Pentagon think this, but there is a very widely held view in US strategic analytic circles that the United States continues to have clear escalation dominance over China in nuclear weapons, which I think is a simple mistake. I think China has lots of attractive uh, options to deprive the United States of escalation dominance. I don't think the Chinese have escalation dominance either. I think neither side have it. But if the United States believes they have it, they will take, they will take bigger risks than, uh, than I think they should. So it, it, it should factor into the calculations on both sides. It should, of course, impose a high degree of caution and rationality. Um, and probably 95 times out of 100 it will. Um, but one wants to be really careful of that 5% of that Possibility that makes that makes me very cautious. Yeah. Okay. I was going to ask um, if I remember your paper correctly. You make a case towards the back end of it that because of um, Australia's position um, and relationships with both China and the US, that we could we might be in a position to be like an interlocutor or a sort of a um, between the two. In the five years since you published your paper, how have we gone both maybe at an official level and maybe an informal yeah. level on that? Yeah, no, thanks, Katie. Good question. I, I, didn't, I didn't actually argue that we could be an intermediary between the US and China. That is to get between them and kind of do the kind of Henry Kissinger shuttle diplomacy thing. Um, I mean, there are circumstances in which that can happen, but I don't see any future. I don't see any situation in which Australia can play that intermediary role, and um, because in the end, actually, the US and China can and do talk to one another themselves quite effectively, or at least they talk. Um, but uh, I, but so, so my proposition is a different one. It's not that we should be an intermediary. 
It's that we have an immense interest in how their relationship develops. And we should, as a country, be uh, bold in asserting what we think they should each be doing. Now, it seems to me the most natural way of us doing that is to talk to Washington. We are, after all, a US ally and all of that. But I don't think we, sh I don't think we should abstain from talking to Beijing as well. Um, and it, so my argument is that Australia should be going to Washington and going to Beijing and saying to Washington, we think you should be willing to share some power with China. We think you should accept that China is going to play a bigger role in the region, but you should also be prepared to continue to play a big role yourself. You shouldn't walk away. And we should be going to Beijing and saying, you should be accepting that the United States will continue to play a significant role in Asia. You shouldn't be aiming to push push uh, America completely out. Now, you might say, who's going to listen to Australia? Well, a good point, but uh, actually, Barack Obama chose to come here to deliver the big pivot speech, and he chose to come back here to deliver by far and away his pa most powerful speech on China since the pivot speech. I think they're trying to tell us something. I think Australia's actually, in Washington's view, I think Australia's actually quite important in this. I wouldn't exaggerate our, our weight in Beijing, but the other point I'd make is we don't have to do this alone. Because the little sketch I gave in answer to John's point, very important point before about how the rest of the region sees us, does seem to me to have pretty universal application. Nobody wants to live under China's shadow. Everyone wants the United States to stay engaged, but nobody wants escalating US rivalry. I don't think we have to do this alone. I think we can go to Korea, Indonesia, Singapore, India for that matter. Japan's a bit different. Uh, we can all start sending this message. And so not, it's not an intermediary role, but it is a, this is what I think to both of them. And I reckon we should be pretty loud about it. Couldn't agree more. That's where the game's at in all the regional yeah. diplomacy. Yeah, yeah if we've got some more questions. Up the back. My question is also about the role of Australia in the Pacific. I can hear you, Rosemary. My question is always about the South China Sea. Did you anticipate that China would start building solid aircraft carriers? <laughs> um, and how far do you think they'll actually push that to interrupt the sea lanes? Or is it just all bluff? Do you want to have a... Uh, I reckon nobody knows the answer to that. And I think over here, they're kind of... You know, if they have a war room, they're asking exactly those questions, and in Washington as well. Um, okay, what is the actual strategic benefit of these? Is it just a sinkable aircraft carrier that doesn't move, or um, does it change the ground? Now, uh, does it change the facts on the ground in material ways, allowing, enabling forced projection? I think the single most difficult thing is it's really confusing. You know, the fact you have to ask that question is, okay, you know, we believe in freedom of navigation. Okay. Now, but in the past, we've been actually implicitly, as a means of courtesy, flying, doing detours around this island and this one. Do we change our, you know, which of these 40 islands, you know, 10 of which are new? How do we, you know, so I think there's some very, very detailed and complicated and confusing cartography going on <laughs> trying to work out the answer to that question. So at the very yeah. least, it's yeah. confused the whole strategic yeah. picture. Yeah, no, I, think that's, I think that's right. I mean, I, they might be unsinkable aircraft carriers, but they're not undestroyable ones. As bases, they're of very little use in anything of an intense war. I mean, they're just a target waiting to be uh, excised. Um, I actually think, by far and away, the biggest significance of those bases is the, is the challenge they pose to America's capacity to stop them. And I think America has walked into that trap. Um, uh, I, I don't myself think they're a very significant challenge to freedom of navigation in any practical sense. I think there are some legal questions there which are quite intriguing, but I think in terms of is China going to use them to stop uh, shipping, you know, shipments of iron ore from the Pilbara to, oh, hang on, they're going to China. That doesn't sound right to me. But uh, I do think by doing something which America obviously doesn't like, by tempting America to stand up and say, we want you to stop this, and then America failing to find anything effectively to do to stop them reinforces what seems to me to be the principal Chinese message, which is America is not the power that it used to be. And I think it's a failure of US statecraft to stumble into that, which I think is what's happened. I think that's a fair assessment. Um, up in, could you, sorry, 
Yep. Um, Europe is not dominated by Germany or France, but it's sharing by different countries. And same like Asia, if it's only two giants, probably it's too much tension. So I think it may be better if you invite more other countries to sharing, and it's released a lot of more tensions and stress. But I think people from Beijing and also from uh, Washington, they know that. But the question is how? So probably like the, the policy from China that talking about uh, Silk and Road, maybe that's a way to sharing. But that's not, not really about sharing. It's actually a dom another way of dominance. So it's a, from the other way, not inviting more people to sharing the game, but actually excluding the United States. So what do you think about this? Um, look, there was a time when the economic diplomacy was quite effective. Um, and, but that was a time when China didn't seem to be demanding very much. The game has changed. And uh, look, I think anything is possible, but coupled with the, um, the militarised performances that we've seen in the last couple of years, uh, I think it's, you know, I'd be surprised if they get serious diplomatic leverage through these projects um, for a whole host of reasons, including the fact that there's not actually a great history of successful um, offshore Chinese developments really in any sphere. Um, so I don't see that why this would be any different, particularly if it's being imposed strictly on Chinese terms. Um, but early days, I think we bears close watching. Mm, yeah. Should we give a, a right of reply up here? Hi, good evening. Hi, Hugh. Hi, John. Uh, Rob Lee with the U.S. Embassy. Um, and appreciate your thoughts and comments. Um, if you allow me uh, just to, to speak briefly, because I think Hugh made some claims about U.S. policy that, frankly, is just inaccurate. So uh, I feel it's my, my duty to, to actually set the rec record straight uh, in terms of U.S. policy objectives and that U.S. ultimately is about dominance in the region. And frankly, I, I, I know he, you've had conversations with U.S. Uh, officials as well, and that's not really an accurate reflection of what our goals are. And I would also encourage people to, if you didn't read the Obama speech in Brisbane, to read it for yourself, because I also disagree with his characterization of uh, it being the most anti-Chinese speech made by any U.S. leader. Uh, let me um, ask you, which one was the most anti? <laughs> Just joking. <laughs> no, but um, I think the Obama speech in Brisbane actually lays out, again, reiterates what U.S. goals are. And I think I would summarize as, you know, a lot of the discussion tonight is sort of a, a summary of the discussion I've seen over the past two years uh, serving as a diplomat here. And the question seems to be, who would, should rule the Asia Pacific? And I think our point is really not who should rule, but what the rules ought to be to make sure that the prosperity and peace we've seen in the Asia Pacific will continue. And did not President Obama say in the State of the Union address, we should make those rules? That's a quote. We should make those rules. Well, on the TPP, the, uh, the, there, there is a discussion about setting the standards that should govern the trade of the region. So th that's spoken in that context and also within the U.S. domestic d debate. But I think there's also a visit that you know, we, no one brought up this evening of President Xi heading to the U.S. and that will also be an important opportunity. So there are a lot of discussions between U.S.-China about managing this relationship, with, which is vital to the United States. It's vital to us economically, it's vital to, to us strategically. So I think that point is also often lost in the debate, that the U.S. has enormous uh, interest at stake in making sure that we get the relationship right. And I think the Chinese also recognize that as well. So I think the, the picture isn't quite as grim as this, you know, battle between U.S. and China uh, over supremacy. Um, but that really, it's a matter of getting the rules right because it's an outcome that will affect it, the entire region. And I believe that the framework that's been established over the past 50 years has worked rather well for the entire region, China included, in that there are ways to fine tune those rules to make sure uh, Beijing's concerns are addressed but what we don't want to see 
is the use of coercive power to um, to make gains to uh, to be able to to dominate the region. So that that's something that not only the U.S. is concerned about, but really countries throughout the region. And it's a conversation that needs to be had to make sure what what are the right rules to ensure peace and prosperity, which is of interest to everyone in, in the region, Australia, U.S., China, and all the citizens in the region as well. Thank you for um, articulating that position. I think it is important to have that dialogue. It is going to be an exceptionally important um, few days mm. in Washington mm. in the middle of next month. We should all be watching that very closely. I think we've really only got time for one or maybe two short questions. Um, yes, please. <coughs> Uh, he, um, I'm glad that you finally raised uh, the Japan question. Uh, earlier you made a point that nobody in this region really wants intensified rivalry between China and the United States. I see that what Japan's Abe government is doing is, or at least seems to be exactly trying to, um, uh, trying to make the U.S. even uh, move um, toward a more hostile direction is policy toward uh, China. So I was wondering Sorry, what's your... Say, Japan? Japan, yes. yeah. Yes. So I was wondering what, uh, what your view is about Japan's Asia Pacific yes. policy yes. and whether you think Japan is doing the region good service or bad service. Yes. I think I did say it. Thanks, really good question. I think I did say at one point that Japan is a different case, and it is. I think Japan is in a particularly uh, difficult strategic situation and its strategic difficulties make difficulties for the rest of us. Uh, Japan, more than anybody else, feels threatened by China's growing power and I completely understand why. And Japan, more than anybody else, feels dependent on the United States for protection from China. Um, but Japan is kind of locked in a, a kind of Newtonian contradiction there, that the stronger China becomes, the more they fear it China, but the stronger China becomes, the less confident Japan can be of America's support for Japan in the face of China's um, pressure. And so Japan finds itself um, in a position where the, it, it, it wants, to, in, in order to feel more confident of US support, it feels, um, I'll put it the other way around, it feels less and less confident of US support, the better the US and China are getting on. So it feels its security depends on tension between the US and China, but just like the rest of us, it can't live with tension between the US and China. So there's a kind of a, a fundamental dilemma, it seems to me, at the heart of Japanese strategic policy. I, 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 I think the only resolution of that, I think it's a very tight dilemma, and I think the only way out of it is for Japan to cease to rely on the United States. As long as Japan relies on the United States for its security from China, it will be very difficult for the US and China to develop a good strategic relationship because Japan will keep on pulling America back from it. And I think there isn't, I, th I don't think that's the only thing that's driving escalating rivalry between the US and China, because I think the US does have a vision of the, US of the strategic order in Asia, which is incompatible with China's and vice versa. But the Japan factor certainly amplifies it. And if the US and China started to move more closely together, I think Japan would very effectively get in the way. So there's a st strange, very counterintuitive, but I think very hard to escape conclusion is if we want a stable US-China relationship, we'd be better off with Japan, which is no longer a strategic client of the United States. It's a scary conclusion, but I don't see any way around it. To spell that out, Hugh, Japan needs to become a new person. Yes, no, the, 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 if, if I was, I would be very sympathetic. If I would understand the Japanese would argue that they could only do that if they became a minimum, um, if, if they acquired a minimum deterrent of their own. But that's a tough task, you know, I've said that many times. It's a very tough conclusion to draw. The world, in some ways, would be a safer place if your countries had nuclear weapons. But it's always worth bearing in mind that the real imperative is to minimise the chance that nuclear weapons are used. And it may well be there's a lower chance of nuclear weapons being used if Japan has nuclear weapons in circumstances in which US-China relationships are stabilised, or rather than Japan doesn't have <coughs> nuclear weapons in circumstances where, where US-China relationships are unstable. So it's a, it's, a, it's a tough call, but I, I, it's a proposition I'm prepared to defend. Now, I think we've got time for one last killer question. <laughs> <laughs> and, killer question. 
Japanese constitution bans nuclear weapon uh, acquirement, doesn't it? I'm no lawyer, but I'm sure of it. <laughs> yeah, it also bans an army and Scotland. Yeah, self-defense. <laughs> <self -defense. laughs> yes, yeah, I'd... I'd, I'd, much more self, I'd, much I'd, more I'd self -defense. Yeah, I think... Uh, look, it would obviously be an extraordinarily traumatic thing for Japan to make that kind of transformation. Uh, but countries do sometimes go through those changes only when their strategic circumstances get very dire. But that might be, it might be argued that that's exactly what Japan potentially faces. Perhaps not this year or next year, but if one looks, you know, 20 years down the track, which is not very long in this business, uh, I, I think that's, I think it's, it's, it's conceivable that Japan ends up being forced to that kind of choice. Last killer question. Does the advent of oh, Tom Worthington from the Research School of Computer Science, a self-serving question, does uh, the advent of cyber warfare change the equation? Do we have the advent that in a on the beach scenario, countries will not know they're under attack, who's attacking them and uh, in this respect, China has a capability, perhaps, as great of that as you, the USA. Will this destabilise the situation? Very interesting question. First point, I'm not sure that China has a bigger capability than the USA. Americans talk about a lot about what China does to them. Chinese talk less about what the United States does to China. So I, I don't know, but I don't take it for granted that there is a pretty active US capability. But the broader point is, um, I'm, I'm going to admit myself a slight skeptic about the business of cyber conflict as a strategic instrument. Obviously, attacking the cyber systems embedded in people's kinetic military systems is a very important adjunct to ordinary old-fashioned, good old-fashioned kinetic war. You know, you disable my missiles by disabling the computer systems that control them. But that's really just, you know, part of what you might call normal kinetic war. The really, the, the revolutionary possibility is that states can now achieve genuine strategic effects, fundamentally change the behaviour of states by attacking one another's cyber systems. Now, the argument in favour of that is that our societies are immensely dependent on cyber systems and therefore will be very sensitive to their disruption. But that reminds me of the argument that people made in the 20s and 30s about the effect of aerial bombing. That is that, that once the air fleets appeared over national capitals and dropped tens of tonnes of high explosive on national capitals, the population of those capitals would rise against their governments and demand peace. And it wasn't true. The Germans killed 40,000 British civilians, the British killed, pick a number, 500,000 German civilians, and they didn't stop them, let alone what we did in Japan didn't stop them fighting. And I suspect, you know, it'd be a real pain in the neck if, if uh, you know, country X, the Khmerian cyber warriors closed down the ATMs and I can't get the money out. I'm being a bit flippant, but it, the thing about societies like ours is that they're, in societies, societies in general, they're terrifyingly robust. They will take an enormous amount of punishment without stopping. And so I, I just, I'm not sure that, um, I'm pretty sure that states could resist even very serious cyber disruption uh, as a strategic effect. So it had a huge impact, you know, close down the bank system, close down the air traffic control system, but compared to a full-scale nuclear attack, pretty small potato. So I don't think it actually changes the strategic calculus. I might be wrong. <laughs> I might be wrong about that. <laughs> might be wrong. Um, you heard it first.